What is the significance of the all-seeing eye? A short question, but one which demands a long answer. Good evening, and welcome to tonight's presentation, From the Quarries, an archive of Masonic lore. Are we not taught that every character, emblem, or symbol in Freemasonry has a peculiar meaning? There is need for a careful explanation of them all. Especially this is so, I think, in the case of the all-seeing eye, since it is seldom referred to directly, but is often implied. Nature seems to have built the physical eye as a light perceiver in response to a demand. Light rays impinging upon the animal kingdom in its earliest stages of evolution have produced an organ of perception. The late Professor Huxley has said somewhere that the perception or recognition of light in some manner apparently called forth the eye, and light alone maintains it. Where there is no light, there can be no eye. Where animals have withdrawn and dwelt in the dark, their eyes have become degenerate and atrophied. Thus, at the start of our inquiry, let us realise the close connection of an eye with light, both in the physical and, as I hope to show, the metaphorical aspects. The portrayal of what is known as the all-seeing eye is one which is familiar to all Freemasons, for it occurs frequently and in many places. It often figures, for instance, on Lodge summons papers, Sometimes it is found depicted centrally on the ceilings of our temples. It is made use of in Masonic jewellery. And, most notably, it appears as an irradiated eye within a triangle enclosed by compasses on the jewel pendant from the collar chain worn by the Grand Master himself. It figures, too, in the Royal Arch. Obviously, therefore, it is of no little importance in the Masonic scheme of things and it were well if we considered the matter together and attempted to find out whence it arose and also, if possible, something of its inner meaning. An eye, or eyes, appear to have been made much of in the mystery systems of antiquity and also in both classical and non-classical mythologies, etc. Our ancient Egyptian brethren had their eye of Horus, There was the fearsome eye of Polyphemus, one of the Cyclops. In India, the Hindu reverences the eye of Shiva, and in the Kabbalistic mysteries of Israel, the eye was held in great awe, where it was taught that were that divine eye, known sometimes as Ketha, to close but for an instant, all created things would cease to be. This thought is implied in the volume of the Sacred Law, where we read in Psalm 121, Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Again, in the legends of ancient Scandinavia, the great god Odin, in the beginning of time, is said to have pledged an eye for a draught from the well of wisdom, wherein all the future was mirrored, and beside which grew the sacred tree of life. And lastly, do not let us forget the single eye of the Christian Gospels. I have mentioned all these matters, and there are many other instances to be known, to show you how the eye has always been held in great veneration from the very earliest of times, and under many races. It is also known that the word eye, or eyes, was an ancient expression used in the mysteries, meaning mighty and divine intelligences, and such as these represented the manifold powers and attributes of God. Think, in this connection for a moment, of the vision of St. John and the four beasts. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind, and they were full of eyes within. 
and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, and is, and is to come. Similar is Ezekiel's vision of the cherubim and the wheels. The four beasts, perhaps you may already have perceived, have a direct but veiled connection with the four hermetic elements and the four hierarchies of angels, whilst the wheels, ever moving forward, never turning back or going aside, can be said to represent the progressive energy of life, an unswerving course on a straight path. There is a further mystical meaning too in the vision of Ezekiel, for the prophet, I am led to understand, uses the word gel, which in Hebrew means either revolutions or revelations. To these mighty-eyed wheels or divine beings, the hidden mysteries of God are made clear. From all I have said so far, you should not find it strange that reference to an eye is made in Freemasonry, which fraternity may we not justly consider as a lesser mystery system of the present epoch, containing all the essentials of the great teachings of its forebears, though now but a pale shadow of the past grandeur of its ancestry. Later on, I hope to briefly draw your attention to the philosophical and Masonic connotations of our all-seeing eye. But what I want to do now is to explore at some length one line at least of its development, and I am going back to ancient Egypt to do so. In one of the past transactions of the Masonic Study Society of London is recorded some remarks put forward in the course of a discussion by the late Worshipful Brother Cleland on what is known as the Eye of Horus. And I feel if we study the Egyptian cosmological aspect of our problem, we may learn much. I am not trying to say in any way that the Eye of Horus is the one and only origin of our all-seeing eye. I do not think that anyone could say that with certainty. But the Egyptians had a civilization among the oldest and the most advanced known to history. And so what they may have to teach us in the matter has distinct bearing upon our problem, though by no means the only answer. I am simply taking one line of thought and exploring it, as could very well be done with others. Let us therefore discover, if we can, why the Eye of Horus, or Utchat, as the Egyptians called it, was held so sacred, and further expand Worshipful Brother Cleland's past remarks. Before I do this, I would ask you to bear with me whilst I say a word or two about Horus himself. Horus was one of many forms of the sun god Ra, and the word Horus, or Heru, means he who is above. The Egyptian symbolic theology and theosophy was highly involved, but Horus, wherever he appeared as a youth, the Greek Harpocrates, represented the earliest rays of the rising sun, the dawn in the east, in fact, and was the chief form of Ra when embattled against the powers of darkness and evil represented by his brother Set. In this great conflict, the Egyptians tell us that certain priests or followers of Horus assisted him, and that they were armed with weapons of metal and had a collective name meaning workers in metal. At Edfu, one of the principal centres of the Horus cult, the god was worshipped as Lord of the Forge City, and in the temple there was a sanctuary called the Foundry, where this blacksmith cast of priests attended on the god, who was known as Horus Behutet. I mention this since those of us who are master masons may find this point productive of much thought, as here, undoubtedly, Horus represented the first artificer in metals. The name Horus Behutet is probably the equivalent of that used by us, which is its Hebrew alternative probably substituted later. Other nations had their blacksmith gods too, of course, such as Hephaestus of the Greeks, 
Vulcan of the Romans, and Thor of the Scandinavians. Vyland Smith of Norse and German legend, known to us as Wayland Smith, comes into the picture too. Collectively, this order of Egyptian priests were known as Companions of Horus, and they were said to be born symbolically from out of the womb of Mother Isis, who, in the inner teachings of the Egyptians, seems to have stood for the mystery schools themselves. We, too, are just as much the figurative sons of the widowed Isis, and could correctly be called sons of Horus. Let us return to our main theme, however. The Utchat, or Eye of Horus, was used by the Egyptians in many ways. Most commonly, it is found painted on shrines and coffins, such as, for instance, on the famous Amelopolis II. The idea being that on whatsoever it appeared was automatically placed under the protection of the sun god. Quite often, we find two eyes, a right and a left. These are said by Egyptologists to represent one of two things, either the sun and the moon, or, alternatively, the sun considered in the two main diurnal phases of its journey across the sky, from dawn to noon, and from noon to sunset. There is an ancient Egyptian text which itself states that one of these two eyes was black and the other white. We shall return to this later, for I think it is quite an important and helpful pointer in our search. I have discovered a further instance from quite another source, that of the Aztecs of ancient Mexico, and indeed of the Toltecs before them, who apparently made use of a ritual mask of Quetzalcoatl, the sun god, showing one eye black and one white. But the Utchat perhaps found its greatest use as an amulet, since it was supposed to give not only protection to its wearer, be he dead or alive, but was reputed to impart vigour and strength, similar to that which the earth receives from the sun. The ancient texts further tell us that to obtain full benefit from such an amulet, it should be consecrated at the time of the summer solstice. I think I have said sufficient to show you that this sacred eye was intimately connected with the sun, and, in fact, a part of a solar cult. In one of the many and very beautiful hymns to Ra, which are available to us, it is to be found these words. Thou that openest the two eyes and the earth is full of light. Which, apart from its more obvious meaning, should be interpreted mystically, as no doubt it was intended that it should. It is conceivably possible, even probable, that the Utchat had other important uses than those I have mentioned. It may have been used as an actual jewel of some Egyptian degree, since there appears an idea that it was worn ceremonially by both priests and priestesses. Whether this was so or not, we shall perhaps never know for certain, and I am not prepared to argue about it. Now let us look into another and deeper aspect of the Utchat, as it was probably understood by the initiate priests in those far-off days. At one of the important periods in Egyptian history, the great trinity of the gods consisted of Osiris, Isis, Horus. There are many ancient tales told about these three. Horus was the child, of course, arising from the mystical marriage of the former two. Now, I have mentioned elsewhere that there existed, and exists, an occult philosophy of numbers, a sort of divine geometry known as sacred gematria, a matter much too intricate to enter into here, for it would require a paper all to itself to do so. This philosophy of numbers has been attributed by some to Pythagoras, but, in point of fact, it antedates that great initiate by a considerable period of time. This hidden application of numbers played a very conspicuous part in the mystery systems of Israel, and also elsewhere in the ancient world, and is capable of giving us an interesting key or clue 
to many matters in a most surprising way, not excluding our Freemasonry of today. Suffice it to say that the number three was given to Osiris, the number four to Isis, and the number five to Horus. Let us try and see why three, four, and five were the numbers allotted to the Osiris, Isis, and Horus trinity. One, unity was always regarded as fundamentally unmanifest, because when divided into any other number, it left them entirely unchanged. Two, duality is negative and static. It gets nowhere until it produces a third by interaction. Three is considered, therefore, the first effective number, hence its being attributed to Osiris or any other similar godhead. The ancients usually considered all odd numbers as male and all even numbers as female, for reasons it is impossible to launch forth into here. Four is the first so-called effective female number, and was so allotted to Isis, or her equivalent. Five is the product of three and four when holding a right angle between them, and was thus given to Horus, the offspring of Osiris and Isis, in one aspect of Egyptian mythology. As an example of the use made of such numbers, we can take Osiris and Isis by themselves, when their mystical marriage together gives us seven, always regarded, as you all know, as a most perfect and sacred number. It is the mathematical symbol, if you like, for Father, Mother God. But to return to our trinity, if to the three of Osiris and the four of Isis we join the five of Horus, we can produce from these three diagrammatically a triangle whose sides measure three, four, and five units respectively. This was of immense importance to the great nation of pyramid builders, as it is to all of us who have since followed after, for such a triangle is a perfect right-angled triangle, and contains that great operative secret of laying out lines at 90 degrees to one another. This peculiar triangle came in a later period to be known as the Golden Triangle of Pythagoras. And remember, Pythagoras was well-versed in the Egyptian mysteries. Today, we make use of this ancient and valuable piece of knowledge in architecture, and so on, and even in such ordinary matter as that of laying out a tennis or a badminton court correctly. The use of this particular triangle is the most ancient method known for making a right angle at any given point without the possibility of error. It seems almost quite certain that the builders of the Great Pyramid, which the Egyptians themselves called Kut, or Light, were actually the first to discover this secret many thousands of years ago. It would appear that our ancient Egyptian brethren had no decimal system, and that they extracted square roots with great difficulty. Thus, this secret of theirs had the advantage of forming a figure compounded of sides consisting of quite simple whole numbers. You may well, by now, be thinking, what has all of this got to do with the sacred eye? I will now attempt to show you. Suppose we take the 3, 4, 5 triangle, bearing in mind carefully both its operative and speculative meanings. And suppose we dedicate it to Horus the sun god, by placing it within the hieroglyph for the sun, which incidentally is well known to Masons. Now, if we further elaborate it by adding eyelashes on the hypotenuse to the number of five, the number of Horus, and further add also the distinctive mark of the scalp lock of the youthful Horus, we are beginning to build up something very interesting. Before proceeding, may I just recall to your minds the inner significance of this scalp lock. It was a coil or lock of hair hanging down one side of the face and was a method used by the Egyptians to designate a child or youth. Horus the Younger 
is generally so portrayed in both painting and sculpture. We should know from our former studies that a child or a youth, in what we may term the language of the mysteries, which is indeed largely used in the volume of the sacred law itself, always signified an initiated or perfected or godlike person. You may perhaps remember the words of the Christian master bearing on this truth. Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. Can we not already begin to see something of the immensity of the symbolism we are building up? Now, let us place over our sketch the hieroglyph for the vault of heaven as it were an eyebrow, implying that everything beneath it is brought into manifestation. Let us also join up the endpoints of the various lines. And what do we get? We get a typical, though diagrammatic, representation of the Utchat. I venture to suggest that the three, four, five secrets are symbolized therein. I think it is extremely likely that where two eyes are depicted, one was regarded as masculine and one as feminine, especially if we bear in mind that the ancient texts themselves tell us that they refer to the sun and moon, which are always considered as such. Further, sometimes one eye was black and one white. Remember Quetzalcoatl. Is there not a tradition that the great twin pillars before the porchway or entrance to King Solomon's temple were also one white and one black? And are they not often regarded as representing masculine and feminine cosmic forces respectively? I maintain, therefore, that as with the pillars, so with the twin eyes. Both stand for the same thing, the eternal duality in the cosmos, as does our tessellated pavement. I can't help feeling that there is some connecting thought between eyes and pillars, if we call to mind that Horus is the sun god, and that the mystical Solomon, Sol Om On, is also a sun man, as his very name implies. Thus, our twin eyes, as with the pillars, stress for us the perfection to be found in the blending of two opposite forces, the perfection and the harmony of the spiritual androgyne. The Utchat is surely a very wonderful, though involved, piece of imagery containing not only a hint of a great operative secret, but also matters of deep inner and spiritual significance. Before I conclude, I would like to add a few words concerning the Master's Jewel, for again, the lines of thought which we have just been investigating are linked with it. The Jewel is termed a square, that its two arms are 90 degrees one with the other. We find this Jewel first mentioned as such in the minutes of Grand Lodge of 1724, although it is not referred to in our actual constitutions until about the year 1815. The jewel, as we find it today, has both its arms of equal length, but this was by no means the case originally. The actual construction of the jewel would appear to have been left in the hands of Masonic jewellers about the middle of the 19th century, who were responsible for its present form. If, however, one studies ancient tracing boards and floor cloths, and if one examines actual examples to be found in Masonic museums and pictured elsewhere, we shall discover that originally this square had two arms of unequal length. Why? Well, of course, the simple, usual, and obvious answer is that if the arms were not equal, the jewel would not hang straight. But why should it? For it was never designed to be just symmetrical, but in order to veil secrets of vast antiquity. What then should be the proper length of the two units of its two arms? They should and can be found to have been three and four units each. This being so, then the distance between the open points must be five. We have, therefore, in fact, a concealed reference to the three 
four, five triangle, symbol of Godhead. With regard to the jewels of the Worshipful Master and the immediate past master, the three, four, five triangle is inherent in both. The Master's Square, if accurately and correctly made, contains this three, four, five triangle in veiled form. It is also true to say that the IPM's jewel contains this fundamental three, four, five triangle more openly than does the master's jewel, as is only natural. The IPM represents the perfection of mastership, for it is his duty to be watchful and to be the all-seeing eye of his lodge. He represents that spiritual vision within the temple, which vivifies and keeps within bounds the faculty of intuition represented by the worshipful master. It is, therefore, both meet and right that his, the IPM's, jewel should be the all-seeing eye, albeit represented and concealed under the symbolism of the three, four, five triangle, except in the case of the jewel worn by the most worshipful, the Grand Master himself, when the irradiated eye appears, as I have already stated in my text. Summing up, we can say, therefore, that the three, four, five triangle is shown openly in the Master's jewel or square. It is only implied there, but the symbolism becomes much clearer in the case of the IPM's jewel, for those qualified to comprehend something of its immense meaning and profundity. It is quite possible to quote various authorities in support of what I have said in this paper, but as the late Worshipful Brother Cleland has pointed out, since the 3-4-5 triangle is so fundamental in Freemasonry, occurring constantly as it does in many veiled ways, I do not consider it requires any such bolstering up. May I just point out, I have no time to do more, that the 3-4-5 proportion has applications of a very wide significance, for it is to be found, so we are told by those entitled to say so, in the common chord of music. And further, it is probable, if not a fact, that there is also an analogy with the number of vibrations per second in the primary colours of the solar spectrum. It has a cosmic meaning for us, you see. All this could be elaborated much further, showing, for instance, the connection of the Master's Jewel with the unequal armed squares of our old operative brethren's seventh degree, and with the Egyptian square, which was regarded as an instrument of immense power and used as the hieroglyph for God. In our Freemasonry, this teaching would seem to be perpetuated. What a vast amount is implied when we say we are on, or we act on, the square. What, however, I would like you to think about is the connection in symbolism of the Master's Jewel with the Sacred Eye, for both are expressions of the same basic idea, and both are connected with Mastership. Thus, we have traced together, in some detail, many things which are shown forth by a study of just one particular eye, that of Horus. But, as with all those other eyes which I mentioned at the commencement of my answer to this question, there remains another and even more profound mystery yet, which, in such a paper as this, I do not feel inclined to speak. I would say, however, that all these sacred eyes not excluding their purposely concealed allusion to a certain atrophied organ, or should I say embryo organ, in the human head, said to be capable, in certain circumstances, of acting as a link between the objective and subjective states, between the visible and invisible worlds. I now come to the conclusion of the matter, and, as foreshadowed earlier, I will close with some remarks regarding the mystical meaning of the I. I am persuaded that, together with our irradiated Masonic I, both of the craft and the royal arch, 
the I refers to the development within ourselves of that true inner light and vision which is capable of irradiating and flooding our whole being. Truly is the eye the window of the soul, especially with reference to the royal arch. Is the eye a symbol of prophecy, a revealer of the divine mind? It also stands, in general terms, for the possibility of the extension of our normal consciousness, a power surely befitting a master, as an example of a divinized man, and a fortiori belonging to the Grand Master himself, a most proper and seemly symbol to be worn by him and emblematic of his supreme office and powers. Lastly, we should regard the eye masonically as a signature of God himself, the light of the world. It represents for us the divine overseer of all our work and labour, and, above all, points to the omniscience of the great architect of the universe in his supernatural wisdom, concealed but present everywhere in all things. Whenever, therefore, we see a representation of the eye, we should think of that light which lighteth every man who cometh into the world, and our very hearts echo the prayer of the royal Solomon himself. That thine eyes be open upon this house, day and night. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, thy whole body also is full of light. But when thine eye is evil, thy body also is full of darkness. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. For a deep dive into the history, philosophy, and traditions of Freemasonry, subscribe to From the Quarries. You will find hundreds of lectures, presentations, shorts, and other Masonic works written by Freemasons for Freemasons. Visit FromTheQuarries.com or YouTube at FromTheQuarries.